Hello and welcome to our first debate of term. The motion today is this house would introduce a universal basic income. To open up the case for the side and proposition of this motion, this house would introduce a universal basic income. I want to, want to welcome Ambika Segal, a first year class, classical archaeology and ancient history student um, at Lincoln College and a member of the Union Secretaries Committee. Ambika, the floor is yours. Mr. President, I'd firstly like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to open this debate. I must admit, as a classical archaeology and ancient history student, I immediately panicked at the idea of beginning the first debate of term. Spending my whole life looking at coins and pottery fragments, how could I add to a debate on UBI, especially when set against expert economists and MPs who have devoted their lives to the study of economic policy? I wonder whether the next 10 minutes may be a good opportunity to go and fill up your drink. I hope, however, those who haven't already switched over to the football whilst waiting for the experts to speak will find something interesting to listen to. Errol Graham, 57, died just after the Department of Work and Pensions removed his disability benefits. He weighed just 28 kilos when he died. Chris Gold was told he was fit to work after a severe stroke. He later lost his home and relied on food banks after the Department of Work and Pensions refused his universal credit claim. Weeks after losing his final appeal to the DWP, he passed away. Yet the fact that the Disability Rights UK estimates that 5,000 people died waiting for employment and support allowance that had been withheld in error is more than a tragedy. It is a damning statistic and reveals the truth that our current benefit system is not working and desperately needs fixing. Voting against this motion tonight is a vote in favour of business as usual. A, bu a business as usual that resulted in the deaths of Errol Graham, Chris Gold and thousands of others, despite living in one of the richest countries in the world. I urge you to believe that we can change that. The idea of universal basic income is hardly the craze, craze novelty that its opponents have made it out to be. Evidence of similar programs has been found in ancient Athens. The Greeks focused on an economic system that minimized scarcity and attempted to ensure everybody had a basic standard of living, the underlying philosophy of any universal basic income. One of the most profound features of ancient Greek society was the high level of voluntary action. They did not maintain a professional army and instead relied upon the participation of the population and ran the government without financial incentive. Under a system that reduced scarcity and competition and increased in abundance and leisure, the Greeks no longer had to worry about basic needs and were able to channel most of their energy into contests in athletics, creativity and public service. The case of the Greeks suggests that when society trusts its members and not only provides them with tools and resources, but immerses them in a culture of mutual aid, goodwill and public service, people will strive to contribute and become more able to realise their potential as individuals. The abject failure of the status quo should be enough to vote with the proposition tonight. But in case it is not, I will give you three reasons to join me in a virtual eye lobby at the end of this debate. Firstly, that a basic income would do exactly what it says on the tin. It would provide a basic standard of living to everybody in this country without fear or favour. The COVID-19 pandemic has pushed the number of people living in relative poverty in the UK to more than 15 million. A shocking fact when considering how prosperous this country is. If you do not agree with me that everybody deserves water, a roof over their head and enough food to, to not starve to death, then I gladly encourage you to vote against the motion tonight. If starvation on the streets and in the homes of Britain is something you're uncomfortable with, then the introduction of a universal basic un income is a solution you're looking for. Secondly, that universal basic income will increase the wealth of us all, giving people the freedom to upskill and re-educate themselves or to move into jobs into a more prosperous industry or to start a business without fear for where their next meal is coming from. This can only be good news for our economy. I firmly believe that individuals can choose better than the government where their money should be spent and UBI gives them the freedom to do just that. Finally, I will argue that universal basic income is not just a luxury that we are fortunate to be able to afford, but a necessity if we're not to fall into a deadly Malthusian trap as robots replace skilled workers in an array of industries. Before I attempt to convince you further to vote with this motion, it falls upon me to introduce tonight's speakers. Speaking first for the opposition, we have Eliza Dean, a first year classics and French student at Christ Church and a phenomenal member of Secretary's Committee. Having rolled up to college at the start of Michaelmas term in a Rolls Royce and promptly elected Christchurch's JCR secretary, as turkeys wouldn't vote for Christmas, Eliza wouldn't speak in favour of UBI. Secondly, I would like to introduce Marco Anunziata, former chief economist and head of business innovation strategy at General Electric Company. Having sold his soul to Silicon Valley, he now works as a, as a consultant, focusing on economic policy, including the possible effects of instituting UBI. His re redefining of UBI as a universally bad idea is, I believe, a clear indication of his opinion of the subject of this debate. But I am hopeful that I can persuade him of the social benefits of UBI tonight. Third, we have Professor Hilmar Schneider, 
a director of the Institute of Labour Economics in Bonn, an outspoken critic of UBI in Germany, Professor Hilmar has authored numerous articles on this subject, novelly comparing UBI to winning the lottery. That doesn't sound too bad to me. Fan finally, we have the Right Honourable John Crudders, Labour MP for Dagenham and Raynham, and former policy coordinator of the Labour Party. As one of the 36 Labour MPs to nominate Jeremy Corbyn as candidate in the Labour leadership election of 2015, John swiftly changed his mind and later supported Owen Smith the following year. Let's hope he's as malleable tonight after listening to the arguments from my side, the proposition. Mr. President, these are your guests and they are most welcome. In 1967, Martin Luther King Jr. advocated for guaranteed minimum income, arguing that it would eliminate poverty. In the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, I find this to be more pressing than ever before. The pandemic has reinforced existing long-standing concerns about poverty and income insecurity. But this pandemic has also reinforced the point that we have the funds to solve this problem, with the Chancellor promising whatever it takes to support those who are facing financial insecurity over the pandemic. One is forced to wonder, why are those who can't put food on the table because of the pandemic closing their office worth more than those who have lost their livelihoods beforehand? Members, the obvious solution would be to provide all adults with a universal basic income that covers their unavoidable expenses and ensures that they maintain a basic standard of living. Prior to, prior to the pandemic, there were 1.4 million people in the UK seeking either job seekers allowance or universal credit. This has now risen to 2.7 million as of March 2021. It couldn't be clearer to me, and I hope it is obvious to you all, that the Department of Work and Pensions, Job Seekers Allowance and Universal Credit simply isn't working. A government inquiry is underway into 600,000 potential cases of DWP errors in benefits claims, an inquiry run by the very institutions that have failed them so desperately in the first place. This scandal of people being let down at their most desperate and turning to the government as a final resource could easily be stopped. Replacing the existing benefit system with a universal basic income removes the complexities that are so often blundered over, frees up the government employees to help those who want specialised direction or career coaching, and keeps everybody with a roof over their head and food on their tables. Secondly, I want to tell you why universal basic income will not just, will not just be good for those who need it, but for those who are furthest away from its benefits. I'm sure members in the real chamber will have heard enough discussions about trickle-down economics. Reagan's visit half a century ago will have told of how, extra how ordinary people benefit from the prosperity of the 1%. Instead, universal basic income is trickle-up economics. By offering security to every single individual, people are free to pursue their passions to the best of their abilities. Students will no longer be forced to leave education early to seek just any paid job, leading to a higher skilled workforce and more innovation, the driver of economic growth. Further, it would also give workers confidence and improve their bargaining power. If they wanted to take a risk and start a business, they know it won't be at the expense of their daughter's next dinner. If they strike to force their bosses to abide by fair working practices or to be moved off a zero hours contract, it won't be with the risk of losing their bed hanging over them. George W. Bush told the American people that the first priority of the state was the security of its people. He was certainly not the first, nor will he be the last to say it. The vital role of the state in ensuring the security of its citizens has been aligned used by world leaders for centuries. Yet, whilst Bush might have referred to foreign threats, how can a citizen ever be secure when their next rent payment or meal might be dependent on a rogue employer or a deeply flawed government department? Before I leave this debate to the experts, I want to tell you why this is not a decision we can afford to take time over. It is something we need to implement and implement now. For thousands of years, humanity existed in an agrarian economy, with almost all of our labour spent on harvesting the resources of the land. When those resources ran scarce, families would ravage the, fat famines would ravage the population. With the Industrial Revolution, we escaped that Malthusian trap. Innovation led to a population explosion. Yet now we stand on the precipice of, of another revolution. Not one that would lead to millions more jobs, to per million, but to millions less. Not one that would lead to, bus to bustling city centres, but to empty high streets and closed shops. The rise of online retail and the steady march of automation and artificial intelligence is already resulting in factory workers losing their jobs to robots and retailers shutting as Amazon takes over the corner shops patch. I'm sure you've seen the closed shops in Oxford and our other cities. Every boarded up shop is a warning signal of impending change as much as the first puffs of steam of Stevenson's train engine heralded a new beginning just a few hundred years ago. Our choice is simple. To, to accept that there will be less jobs and that those who are fortunate enough to benefit from the rise of technology will survive, whilst others fall into poverty and, and desperation. Alternatively, we can be radical in our, attempts, in our attempt to succeed and change the fundamental structure of our economy. 
gladly there are solutions that rise in front of us tonight. A solution that helps us to retrain, to learn, and above all, to live with dignity. Ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the night, you will be asked to vote on this motion. I believe there is only one choice, to vote with a proposition. Vote I and back a universal basis income. It is necessary that we alleviate the desperate poverty in this country. It is desirable and would increase the wealth of us all. And finally, it is inevitable as our economy adapts to deal, to deal with new technology. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ambika, for a very, very fine speech. Next, to open up the case for the team in opposition, I'd like to welcome Eliza Dean, a first year classics and French student at Christchurch College and a member of the Union Secretaries Committee. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for your introduction. And I'm really honored to be starting off the opposition to today's debate. Um, I also thank the Honourable Member Lincoln College for her introduction. And I heartily agree that there is such a thing as an emergency circumstance. Historically, this has been war, but this last year it has been COVID-19. The actions taken during such a period and the restrictions of liberty that are allowed during a time of emergency should not be interpreted as holding all the time, however. Especially after the devastation caused to the economy by this pandemic, the, co the cost of a universal basic income in, in the United Kingdom, at least at the current moment, would be completely prohibitive, shown in a new report from the Fraser of Allender in Institute, IPPR Scotland and Manchester Metropolitan University on the likely effects of a proposed three-year pilot scheme in Scotland. Providing a UBI or national definition of poverty, 60% of the median income would be completely unaffordable. The top rate of tax would have to be extremely high, a tax rate at which revenue collected falls instead of rising, as increasing tax rates beyond a certain point can be counterproductive for raising further tax revenue. Additionally, the logistics of retracting or decreasing a universal basic, basic income is extremely difficult, <clears throat> often leading to massive cuts in services which are extremely necessary for public good. Start valuing the labour of workers for what they do and reinforcing the systems put in place already, which our first proposition speaker has highlighted have been failing up until now to support those unable to make an income. A universal basic income is not something that will magically take homeless people off the street and can exacerbate these inequalities even more as their benefits are cut and they are forced to live on a small and in inadequate income, which means they will not be able to get by. Don't just put a plaster over a bullet wound. I hope I can convince you all that a universal basic income would be a logistically difficult and damaging deal. But before I expand on my reasoning, it falls to me to introduce the proposition speakers for tonight's debate. Introducing the proposition and thus arguing in favour of the introduction of a universal basic income is the Honourable Member Amber Kasegel, our first elected member of Se Secretary's Committee and the Secretary of Secretary's Committee in her first year studying classical archaeology and ancient history at Lincoln. Ambika, who humbly admits that she didn't know what UBI stood for until this week, is known in college for her collection of gin bottles that she keeps in her room, amounting to 28 one litre bottles in just last Hillary term. So universal basic income might not be something that helps the economy, but with the world of universal basic income at Ambika, we know it's going to at least fund the alcohol industry. I extend a warm welcome secondly to Professor Guy Standing, a co-founder of the Basic Income Earth Network. He is also a professorial research associate at SOAS University of London, an institution which due to its ongoing financial debt crisis may leave him in need of, of a basic income. Professor Standing, along with authoring several books on the subject of UBI and advocating for the concept as a matter of social justice, has enjoyed prominence as an internet meme. His Wikipedia has been subject to a violent edit war, which has claimed many Wikipedia editors of good standing, with many changing his introductory photo to a picture of him in a chair captioned Guy Standing Sitting. Hopefully for him, the audience watching tonight won't be sitting in their ovation after hearing such an outstanding guy speak. Closing uh, next up on the proposition is Anthony Painter, another passionate advocate of the introduction of the universal basic income and co-author of Creative Citizen, Creative State, the principled and pragmatic case for a universal basic income. He is also director of the Royal Society of Arts, an organization which is dedicated to providing universal basic post-nominals. Closing the debate for the proposition is William Grevy, one of our fabulous sponsorship officers, a first year PPE student at St. Hilda's College. He will, of course, be arguing in favour of the introduction of a universal basic income, despite enjoying his spring week and therefore being so much of a corporate hack that he probably won't even need one. Let's hope he doesn't receive too many networking phone calls during this debate to be able to keep his eye on the ball. Mr. President, these are your guests and they are most welcome. 
The main issue that arises is that the utopian dream of a universal basic income is stumped by a major logistical impasse. If you are running a government and giving your citizens a set amount of money each and everything is working out fairly well, when you finally reach a pothole in the form of debt or general economic deficit, pulling back the UBI is extremely difficult as people will not be happy and will not vote for you. However, if you do not do so, you can be forced to cut other extremely important funds, such as those reserved for housing and for education. Therefore, more effective forms of aid are cut to maintain or to increase the universal basic income, which makes everyone, especially those who are already more economically vulnerable to start with, less well off. An example of this is Alaska's permanent fund dividend, which is the longest running example of the implication of a universal basic income in the United States. Um, this program has resulted in a payout of $1,000 to $2,000 per year to all citizens. Uh, and this comes from their permanent fund, which is effectively a type of nest egg, but $1,000 to $2,000 is far too small to live off and thus has a negligible impact on the labor market. Other than these drawbacks, it worked fairly well until their budget entered a deficit due to oil prices de decreasing. So imagine you're a politician in Alaska and you've been hit by a budget crisis, you're at a deficit and you need to get money from somewhere. So you can either decrease the universal basic income or um, cut into other funds. If you decrease the universal basic income, you won't be very popular as the effects of this will be felt immediately by all the citizens of the country as this is a payment to, of course, to their bank accounts. Uh, however, um, cuts, in, um, cuts in funds for housing and education will not be felt as, immediate, as immediately. Um, and therefore, uh, if you were to decrease the universal basic income, you would be extremely unpopular and probably not be re-elected. This is exactly what happened in Alaska. Um, a, po a politician who um, proposed to increase the universal basic income to $6,000 to $7,000 per year was elected. Um, and unfortunately, um, he was unable to do so when he entered um, government. Um, but uh, due to this um, insistence on maintaining the universal basic income, there have been cuts of $130 million in health services, cuts of 31% to their extremely important ferry system. Alaskan public universities have been hit hard by cuts of $70 million or 41% to their budget in favor of maintaining a high UBI. And these universities are on the verge of declaring academic bankruptcy. The promise of a higher permanent fund dividend in Alaska has empowered Republican politicians who get elected year after year stating that they will increase the UBI and cut taxes on the rich and consequently cripple important funding reserves that the government is in dire need of to support its citizens. Furthermore, those who would expect me to argue that a universal basic income should not be introduced as people are lazy and exploitative are dead wrong. As the human argument, human nature argument can often become both hackneyed and harmful as those who exploit a system should not ruin it for the rest of those who really need it. However, as it stands, labor has been extremely devalued in modern society with shame being placed on workers in industries such as manufacturing and retail with a lack of uni unionization and a wage which is often not enough to support a family. Despite the competition for jobs in the retail industry, often being extremely savage, as I have been able to personally gauge after my rejection from every single minimum wage job I applied for in my home city over the course of a year, the benefits and support these workers receive from the government as of now is simply inadequate, especially considering the conditions some workers face, like the hardworking troopers of Oxford Weatherspoons, who upon pubs opening have had to deal with an influx of Oxford student post-collections drinks outings, resulting in queues all the way down multiple streets. Now, the proposition speakers are aiming to introduce a basic income for these workers instead of making sure they can get by on the income that they do earn. Don't put the cart before the horse. Firstly, there must be a focus on reinforcing systems of reward for those who work in our industries already, instead of introducing a universal solution which does nothing but maintain relative poverty. This seems almost as effective as acting like a school nurse in a primary school, slapping a scratchy wet paper towel on a broken leg to miraculously cure it. We would be better off uniting the money in specific programs such as the NHS or the welfare state or improving the current benefit systems. Finally, by introducing a UBI, we are putting massive responsibility in the hands of the state, which has already been recognized as incompetent at the start of this debate. We would rely on this state to effectively be our breadwinner, which would consequently severely decrease our own civil liberties due, due to reliance on a state which has often been exploitative and restrictive. If you'd like to be capitalism's tradwife, a UBI is probably the right way to go. 
just continue re reinforcing the pitfalls of the wage system whilst acting as blind as a deer in headlights if people, for example, those with disabilities requiring more support can't live off a UBI and their benefits have been cut due to budget deficits. The master's tools will never dism dismantle the master's house. Focusing on the example of the United Kingdom, do we really trust a government which is continually attempted to hamstring our liberties with restrictive measures such as those preventing our rights to peaceful protest? For example, the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill of 2021 to carefully handle another one of our fundamental civil liberties. To end with the subject I am most familiar with, one more classical, so as to say, because as you've clearly seen, you can trust a classicist to always bring up their subject. The state providing a universal basic income is like the bread and circuses juveniles spoke about as a handout to appease and placate the masses rather than helping them develop economic and political agency. Don't vote for throwing dust in the eyes of the masses and give us a strong and targeted safety net. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eliza, for a very thought-provoking speech. Next, to continue the case for the side and proposition, we're really honoured to be able to welcome Professor Guy Stanley. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to talk a bit about the fundamental rationale for a basic income, because I believe the justification is ethical, not instrumental. I should say in passing that the references to Alaska and its Alaska Permanent Fund is basically a non sequitur. It isn't a basic income there. And the Republican governors have cut the income tax to zero, which created the budgetary crisis from which they're suffering. But that aside, I want to focus on why we initially have an ethical justification, but this has been compounded by a realization that the global economy has morphed into a system of rentier capitalism, where more and more of the income is going to the owners of property, physical, financial, intellectual property. And a declining share has been going to those who rely on labor. And the rentiers have created a system which is incredibly fragile. And this fragility meant that the pandemic, when it came, was merely a trigger to a major crisis. And that major crisis has shown us that we don't have a sense of robustness in society, an, an immunity to shocks, and we certainly don't have resilience. And suddenly, the basic income has become globally extremely uh, popular, because people see it as a means of giving resilience that existing state policies do not provide. I think this has induced many of the experiments and pilots that have been taking place around the world. You're listening to a man who's had a strange habit for the past 30 years of having been involved in doing pilots of basic income in all in four continents, in numerous countries, different levels of development. I'll come back to that towards the end. The essence of the ethical case is threefold. First, basic income as an economic right, a modest payment to each individual legal resident citizen without conditions, without behavioral conditions and non-withdrawable, paid equally to men and women and regardless of work status, marital status or house sales status. This is the essence of the definition. And every sensible basic income advocate says immediately that state, statement of definition is made that there would be supplements for all those who have extra costs of living to meet, because the idea is to give each, an, each individual material basic security. So there would be supplements for those with disabilities based on their needs, not based on finance, but based on their physical costs or whatever. Now, the first justification goes back to the foundational document of our constitution, the Charter of the Forest, signed or sealed alongside Magna Carta in November 1217. And the Charter of the Forest said that every free man in the country has a right to subsistence in the commons. 
And if you think about the acceptance in our history of the private inheritance of private wealth, which is a lot of something for nothing given to a minority, and every party accepts that, then in equal justice, you can say that the income and wealth of all of us is far more to do with the efforts and achievements of the many, many generations before us, but we don't know whose parents or grandparents made the contributions more or less. So in a sense, it would be a common dividend on the common wealth that's inherited by us. That sense of, of common justice means that the payment to all of us should be equal. We're equal commoners. It's a common justice. And it actually is consistent with a famous Oxford philosopher, John Locke, with his sustenance proviso. You can't have private property unless the sustenance of people is accepted first. Alongside common justice, then you could also say religious justice. God, if you're religious, God gave unequal talents and a basic income would be a compensation for those that don't have talents of making money or whatever it might be. And I was delighted last year when Pope Francis came out in favor of basic e income and he made the following statement. Whether believers or not, we are agreed today that the earth is essentially a shared inheritance whose fruits are meant to benefit everyone. I think that is a very fair justification. It's also a matter of intergenerational justice. I went to Middlesbrough before the lockdown to give one of my books, and I noticed the poverty and the precariat size in Middlesbrough. And I recalled that the Industrial Revolution started there. And the wealth of the country is produced from those iron ore mines that were built up there. Today, the descendants of the mine owners are living wealthily in the South, whereas the descendants of those who created the wealth are wallowing in poverty. In a sense, it's inter intergenerational justice. It's also a matter of ecological justice. The rich cause most of the pollution, the poor pay the price mostly. There's a lot of documentation to show that. We need carbon taxes, but the only way we can get eco taxes politically acceptable because they're aggressive otherwise, is to recycle the revenue to help pay for the basic income. It's also a matter of compassion justice. It's a right, not charity. And we need to reverse the charity state. Means testing, behavior testing, which has gone on and on and on for the past 40 years is a disgrace and a shameful act because it results in huge exclusion errors, huge poverty traps. Those who say, let's focus on the poor, don't realize that there are generations of research that show that doesn't work. It does not work. And then it's a question of work justice. Why do we pay only people who are in things called jobs and not doing all the work outside jobs that are just as essential, if not much more so, particularly the work done by women. I don't have time to go further in the justice arguments, but the second ethical reason is that the basic income, even if it's below the level that all of us in this debate would want, even if it's a modest amount, enhances basic security. Every pilot I've been involved in, even a very modest amount, increases the sense of basic security. But basic security is a human need. It's also a public good. It's a superior public good because the more that people have it, the greater the value to each individual. It doesn't eat away, at, you increase the value of basic security. The psychologists have also taught us that insecurity inhibits the brain cells, narrows the mental bandwidth, and leads to a diminishing IQ. And therefore, it's unfair of us as the state or as individuals to expect people who are insecure to be making responsible 
decisions and judgments. Only if they are secure can you then hold them to account. We've also found in pilots in all sorts of countries that basic security, having basic security induces tolerance, altruism, and it strengthens people's bargaining position very importantly. And that leads to the third ethical justification. The third is that it enhances freedom. Every politician, every social commentator say they believe in freedom. But you can't be free if you're chronically insecure. First, it would enhance libertarian freedom, the freedom to choose. That's why Milton Friedman, right-wing economist, eventually came round to supporting basic income. Because he said, for a market economy to function well, people must have enough security in order to be making rational judgments. More importantly, as far as I'm concerned, it's the freedom to say no. And the emancipatory value of a basic income is greater than the money value. As we found in the pilots, I often ask certain respondents what they think is the best thing about having a basic income. I'll always remember a woman telling me that before she had it, when the wage workers came to her, she had to say yes. Now she had her basic income, she could say no. That's emancipation. The second form of freedom is also due largely to an Oxford philosopher, T.H. Green, liberal philosopher of the 1870s, who understood that liberal freedom meant the freedom to be moral. And you can only be moral if you're not being told what to do or being dictated because you're so insecure. To me, the most important form of freedom is Republican freedom. The freedom of people in unaccountable positions of potential domination. A woman is not free if she has to ask her husband or her father if she can do X or Y, even if she knows that 99% of the time he will say yes. A woman is only free if she can make the decision herself. That is freedom. Now, I've written a book and wrote for John McDonnell a report saying a basic income would help deal with the eight modern giants that Beveridge had initiated with his five giants. And the eight modern giants are inequality, insecurity, debt, stress, precarity, automation, extinction, and neo-fascist populism. But I want to preempt one of those issues. I do not believe automation and the robots and AI are suddenly going to make people redundant. What they are doing, without a doubt, is increasing inequality and insecurity for millions and millions of people. But I don't wish to see a, a rolling back of technological innovation. That is wrong. I think the key argument will prove to be the threat of extinction. We need high eco-taxes. We need to get control of our time. And those are the important aspects. Finally, let me say that I've looked at about 50 of the pilots and experiments that have been done around the world. They're summarized in my books. And I'm going to list the few key findings that come through regardless of the methodology, regardless of the duration, regardless of the type of economy. economy. It's remarkable. The first is that it improves individual health. Health, mental and physical. Second, it reduces people's stress. Third, it leads to better school attendance. There's a wonderful pilot in North Carolina which showed remarkably beneficial effects for the families. Their children had better school attendance and performance. Listen to the next point, please. Having a basic income increases work, not decreases work. 
It increases the productivity of work. It leads people to be more innovative in their work. And it encourages more care work, more voluntary work and community work because people feel able to do those things. It helps to reduce debt and it leads to a greater sense of social solidarity as we saw in a major pilot we did in India, a sense of structured reciprocities where people believe in their community and the need to help each other because they can expect the reciprocities when it comes to their turn for a shop. I ask you to consider the ethical justifications. John Maynard Keynes, the most famous economist of the 20th century, he said that if there's something you really need, we can afford it. Finding the way to afford it through a, count, a commons capital fund, as I proposed, is not that difficult. This back of the envelope calculations are really beneath, beneath contempt. We need to move in the direction of building a fund like the Norwegian fund, whereby you can pay out each year a rising amount as a basic income. And most importantly of all, it's to be on that road, not going away from it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Professor Standing, um, for a very, very fun speech and for joining us here today. To continue the case for the team in opposition, a very warm welcome to Mr. Marco Nunziata, um, and thank you also for joining us today. Thank you very much, Mr. President. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Arguing in opposition to free money for everyone is a thankless and I fear a doomed challenge. But at least having been trained in economics, which Thomas Carlyle called the visible science, I feel well suited to the task. I think UBI is fundamentally unfair. It's unaffordable and riddled with unintended consequences. It would make social problems worse not solve them. To me, UBI's greatest flaw is exactly that it is universal and unconditional and therefore not targeted. That makes it terribly unfair. Why would you give the same amount to a poor unemployed person and to a billionaire? Especially because a country's financial resources are limited, which means that true UBI is unaffordable. Now, in the spirit of Professor Standing, let me also give you a few back of the envelope calculations, which I hope will not be beneath contempt. For the UK, a UBI should consist, as uh, the first honorable member who spoke for the opposition hinted to, should consist of a payment of about 9,000 pounds per year for every citizen age 18 or older. This would be the bare minimum. It would place a family with two adults just above the poverty line. So it doesn't get any more basic than this. Indeed, as we just heard, it would be even more expensive as we would need to provide more to people who have greater needs. Now, there are 44 million people over the age of 18 in the UK. So this scheme would cost about 400 billion pounds per year or one fifth of UK GDP. Perhaps these days, this doesn't sound like much. So let me put it in perspective. At 400 billion pounds, UBI would amount to a half of the entire UK government budget for the financial year 2019, 2020. It would be over twice what the government spends on health, nearly four times what it spends on education. So here we have to decide what we believe. We can believe that we have a magic money tree that we can simply print wealth with no limit and no consequences, year after year. And some economists do indeed believe this. They are the followers of a now fashionable cult known as modern monetary theory, which argues that a sovereign government does not have a budget constraint. If they are right, UBI might indeed be the right policy, but in that case, I believe it would be unimaginative and callous to stop at 9,000 pounds per person. The motto, the aim should be a Ferrari in every driveway or an Aston Martin, if you prefer. Or alternatively, we can accept that UBI will have to be paid for, and the cost will then equal twice the total current revenue from personal income taxes, twice. Will this house double personal income taxes? Here we come to the unintended consequences. Under UBI, everyone would be guaranteed a decent living without working 
while facing extremely high taxes if working. Now, my, the honorable member who spoke first for the opposition did not want to invoke the human nature argument. I will, in a moment, you will understand why when I argue that I think it doesn't take an overly cynical view of human nature to surmise that many people might choose not to work. If did, I would be one of them. And with fewer people working, the taxes on those who do work will have to rise further, which will push more people not to work and so on and so forth. And uh, by the way, if you did not think that people would say no to work, well, Professor Standing should have disabused you of that notion with his speech, so I will say no more. Besides, once a money for free scheme is in place, there will be political pressure to increase the size of the handout, accelerating this virtuous circle of lower employment and higher taxes. Now, these taxes will therefore undermine the economic mobility that the proponents of UBI say they actually want to promote. It will be completely counterproductive. Proponents of UBI, as we've already heard, say that program would also not be inequitable or so expensive. They argue that well-off citizens would not benefit from it because the government would give them money with one hand and take it away from the, with the other through taxes. Taxes are not at 100%, although with UBI, we might eventually get there. Someone in the higher income brackets paying today close to 50% income taxes would still get close to 5,000 pounds that they do not need. Taxes would still need to increase by a massive amount because the full UBI budget would still need to be funded. So the scheme is clearly costly and it is flawed, but why do we need it in the first place? We heard in the first argument of the proposition reference to technological change. And indeed, many proponents of UBI come from the world of technology and tell us we need a UBI because the robots will soon take all the jobs. And at the same time, as we heard in the second speech for the proposition, they reassure us that UBI has been tested in several experiments and we know it works. Now here, of course, if you ask them, well, why do we need to test it? you hear the answer we heard in the previous speech, which is, well, we need to test it to show that people will still work even when we pay them not to work. But when I hear that, I think, but you've just told me that there will be no more jobs. So why are we discussing this? And the answer, of course, is that once the robots are ready to do all the work, by all means, let's divide the fruits of their toil. Let's have universal basic income. But we are not there yet, far from it. Over the past year, when governments told people to stay home to stop the pandemic, production came to a halt. Perhaps the robots were too busy playing chess and go. The other justification for UBI, and we heard it eloquently in the first speech for the proposition today, is that targeted support schemes are fine in principle, but they often fail in practice. And uh, examples of how terribly they fail are dramatic and painful to hear. But the conclusion that giving money to everyone is therefore the most efficient way to help those in need is flawed. We will still need all the targeted schemes. If someone falls on hard times, we are not going to let them starve just because they already got universal basic income. We will still want to help them. We need to improve the targeted schemes. And that, by the way, is the right way to provide basic security. Targeted schemes are a form of insurance, social insurance. It's that social insurance that is aimed to provide basic security. As for the successful experiments that we keep hearing about, they invariably try something that is neither universal, nor basic, nor permanent. This has already been made clear for the example of the Alaska Oil Fund. But I'll give you another example. In Stockton, California, where they gave to a few unemployed people 300 pounds per month for a year, and then they turned around and said, see, many of these people still kept looking for a job. Well, of course. They could not survive on 300 pounds per month, and they knew the payments would stop. Experiments like this tell us nothing about how UBI would work. And the fact that they're often launched by cities that have gone bankrupt in the past, or are financially insolvent today, like Chicago and Stockholm in the US, should give us pause. UBI would impose a massive cost on society. It would create a world where you can get money for nothing, 
and you get punished for working through confiscatory taxes, the demotivating impact on the younger generations would be devastating. Because UBI would signal a fundamental rewriting of the social contract. Today's social contract is based on the idea that everyone has a responsibility to contribute to the advancement of society. You have to do something that society finds valuable and is willing to pay for. You have to get a job. In return, society will look after you if something bad happens, if you fall ill, if you lose your job. And that's a social safety net. UBI turns the social contract around. If a society has a responsibility to ensure you have a good life, you have no responsibility at all. But society is all of us. Raising standards of living is hard work and needs all of us to chip in. Signaling to young people that it doesn't matter what you study, it doesn't matter what skills you build, because you don't need to get a job, would have tremendous negative consequences. Proponents of UBI, as we've heard, argue that UBI would unleash creativity and innovation by freeing people from the burden of having to work for a living. But there is a fairy tale. Most successful companies, most innovations, most works of art are created by people with the need, the drive, and the passion to improve their situation. Necessity, not comfort, is the mother of invention. And by the way, intellectual capital is not rent. Intellectual capital is being created through work, through intellectual work, through innovation. What we see in country after country today is that most companies that rise to the top of the stock market indices have been created recently through hard work and through innovation. This is not the triumph of the grand society. This is the triumph of capitalism. This view of the world that UBI promotes also ignores the simple fact of life that not everyone has a passion and not everyone is equally talented. If UBI had allowed me to pursue my dream of being an opera singer, society would have suffered greatly. And we still need nurses, policemen, plumbers, and perhaps not economists. And some people choose these careers because that's how they find their calling. Others, they choose them because they pay the bills, but these jobs need to be done. The countries that are toying today with the idea of UBI are already deep in debt with pitifully low productivity growth and a massive looming rise in pension and healthcare expenditure because of population aging. These societies desperately need to generate more income and to spend it wisely, not to waste money on those who do not need it. Look, rich societies have a moral obligation to fight poverty. Of course, everyone has the right to sufficient sustenance. But societies also have an obligation and an interest to broaden access to opportunity so that your chances of success depend more on how talented and how hardworking you are and less on your family circumstances. And this means a strong and a targeted social safety net with unemployment benefits, healthcare for the poor, scholarships for bright, low-income students. Social safety nets do need to be improved. We've heard it already today. And it is devilishly hard to strike the right balance between assistance and incentives, to combine strong incentives to work with the assurance that if you lose your job, you will still be okay. It's hard, but that is the problem we need to solve, not how to divide up money that we don't have. UBI would waste precious resources and undermine work incentives. It will make society as a whole poorer and inequality greater. I urge you to vote against the proposition. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Nunziata, for joining us today and for your very fine speech. Next, I want to welcome Anthony Painter, who will be the third speaker on the side in proposition. Thank you very much for joining us, Mr. Painter. Thank you very much. Um, I thought for a moment that the, that the last speaker for the opposition was about to advocate the abolition of um, private inheritance given he wanted to outline how important it was that people succeed on their own merits. But for some reason, he omitted it. Maybe, maybe it was just forgotten. Um, look, we're, 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 we're playing a game of sort of UBI bingo here, at least the, the opposition is. And you hear all this a lot. And, you know, you, you hear the stuff around, well, let's set a UBI at some, some exuberant level of, you know, 15, 20,000 pounds per person per year. And suddenly it's unaffordable. Well, yes. In the current political economy, it is at that sort of level, but no one's advocating 
that. And then you hear, look, you know, if you tot up the cost of it, even at a lower level, it's going to cost hundreds and billions of pounds. Just forgetting that, you know, what it replaces, you don't put it on the other side of the ledger and you take away from that cost. So you, it's always a gross cost that are quoted by the opposition, not the net cost. You know, you, there are savings in things you don't have to pay for, like you know, state pensions, if pensioners have uh, a, a basic income of the same level, but that's not counted. So it's just always inflated. So it always seems undeliverable and impossible. And then you hear saying, look, proponents of UBI, they, they argue that the robots are coming and there'll be no such thing as work and obsolescence, whatever. You haven't heard anything of that nature from the position, from the proposition as, as, as yet. You know, we've argued that automation is driving change and that will impact particular industries in particular ways and particular workers. And they'll need, need the means to adapt but nothing about the, the obsolescence um, of work. You hear, why should the rich get it? You know, they've got enough. Why don't we do these clever targeting um, schemes, which by the way, I'll come back to never, never work and never have. Why should the rich get it? Well, we don't make the argument when it comes to the National Health Service. We don't make the argument when it comes to the basic state pension or, or, or common education. And the reason we don't make it is because they are good ways of ensuring that everybody has a universal level of access and security. It's a very efficient way of providing that, that, that support. And the rich will pay more in taxes. So none of this is, is at all helpful to the discussion, I think. It, it diverts us from a lot of the real conversation that we need to have. And I think the fundamental case for UBI um, is, in, in essence, quite a simple one. It's a need to confront the mega challenge of economic insecurity. Economic insecurity is one of the mega challenges that we face alongside climate emergency, alongside racial discrimination uh, and violence and democratic decay. Um, and actually, once you realize that economic insecurity is a grand societal challenge facing global societies and individual societies, inevitably you start to move towards uh, a UBI. And there's a very simple reason for that, that UBI is hardwired economic security. I'll come back to that. Now, we do a lot of sort of surveying um, at, the, at the RSA. Um, and you know, through this, people tell us their, 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 their feelings of anxiety and insecurity. And we, you know, we found that 55% believe their finances will become insecure in the future. 58 believe the government should do more. 41% have access to savings of 500 pounds um, or less. So wealth and asset um, inequality matters. That's 41% with almost no savings, right? So this is about poverty, yes, absolutely it is. It's about poverty and inequality, but it's also about insecurity. What are you gonna fall back on um, if, if times aren't good? And we know that insecurity matters. Um, we know um, that um, income volatility over time actually is reasonably high. We know that's associated with risk adversity, with mental and physical um, ill health, um, with diseases of despair, drug and alcohol dependence, with lack of trust, with political fear and anxiety and the politics of disillusion. The likes of President Roosevelt knew that. So this is a big deal, but why is UBI? the antidote? Well, there are a number of approaches you can take um, to diminishing insecurity. You can do nothing, um, but then we'll be facing that sort of so social, economic and political disaster I've just described is already um, with us um, in some respects. I mean, you can target resources um, on the poorest with mean, means tested benefits, but invariably they miss. You know, in the context of the pandemic and COVID in the UK context, um, over 3 million people who saw their incomes diminished by uh, a significant amount have received nothing in support. And that's despite the enormous expansion of a, a furlough scheme, a more generous universal credit, we are seeing sort of food banks expand and being on heat. And the first proposition speaker I thought um, eloquently detailed some of the consequences of that on individual lives um, and our, our, our communities. So targeting misses, especially by the way, when you have a rigid sanctions regime, because that is, that is going to deny people access even to the basic level of subsistence. And that's exactly what a lot of Northern European countries in particular do have, including, including the UK. You can insure incomes, but the problem with insuring incomes, it ends up being focused more on older workers and better off workers and still ends up being very costly. And so you can't lean in 
to security for all, to diminishing inequality, to resolving uh, poverty. You can have a job guarantee scheme. And it would be great if we could guarantee a good job um, for everybody, the job that they want, that their skills are adapted to, that they're motivated by. It's difficult to do that. And invariably job guarantee schemes have become very coercive and in effect like, like, like a workfare um, scheme. And what you end up is the need to say no in order to not be pushed into a coercive environment. So you end up needing a universal basic income in order to make a job guarantee scheme work. So none of these schemes ultimately gets to the goal of, of what we're trying to do. Um, UBI does create a baseline, as long as it is funded by progressive taxation or the type of Commonwealth fund uh, that, the, that the second proposition speaker um, outlined, it creates that baseline. And on that baseline, you can then have a foundation with which to reskill yourself, seek work, provide for your family and pursue your goals and ideas. Um, and all the evidence, and we've heard from the trials, and by the way, a lot of these trials have been in whole communities, for example, in, in, in Manitoba, in Canada, whole communities for multiple years. So not just short term and micro targeted and all the rest, there's been lots of different types of UBI schemes. But as the second proposition speaker, they always have come back with similar uh, data, that they improve health, increase, um, trust, they lead to greater domestic tranquility, and all without harming work incentives. Uh, and in fact, the incentive to assist on better work um, is um, there's more fulfilling um, and dignified is one of the big upsides of UBI, far from it being destructive of work. In fact, as Pope Francis said, the UBI could reshape relations in the labour market, guaranteeing people the dignity of refusing employment terms that left them in poverty. The dignity of refusal. And that's what UBI can do that all these other schemes don't, don't, don't achieve. Now, you either you hear that you know UBI is either unaffordable or ineffective. Um, nothing could be further than the truth. And even at a very low level, and you know, we've run a lot of simulated numbers, and even at a level of 60 pounds a week. Um, uh, it makes a huge difference to people's lives. It takes a, puts a dent um, in poverty, it halves destitution, and it reduces inequality, even at £60 per person per, per week. The cost of that, once you move sort of personal allowances into is a universal cash support, is a fiscal shift that is no greater than we saw in the last budget in the UK. So it's affordable and it makes a huge difference. So the ineffective run affordable charge, I'm afraid, doesn't hold either. And then once you've got that baseline, you can start to build it up, including through um, sovereign wealth funds, which you can invest in climate technology and housing and infrastructure. And the returns on that can be recycled as dividends um, for, for, for the people. So there's mechanisms once you've got a baseline that you can, you can build upon. So the thing about UBI, when it comes down, when you boil it down, it is the most effective response to economic insecurity. And it turns out it's not that utopian. It's actually very practical. It's actually very realistic. It's doable, it's affordable, it's effective, even at a very basic level. And if you don't believe me, just watch what's happening in the US. President Biden um, is looking, having introduced in effect a universal child allowance. He's looking to make it permanent. So it's a UBI for families um, in effect. And has he done this and nothing else and forgotten about sort of infrastructure and care and health and school and education? No, he's done it alongside a jobs plan, a climate plan, support for trade unions, support for the minimum wage, investment in care, free preschool education, free post-school uh, education. He's doing it all. Biden's doing it. So you don't have to choose just one response to the injustices and challenges of the time, you can do multiple. So it turns out the advocates for UBI, I think, are the realists in this debate. They're also leaning into the real challenges um, that we're facing. We're facing an economic security uh, emergency. Um, and if we don't nourish society's roots, we won't be able to combat that effective. But I know that this house believes in economic security for all. And so I know that it's going to back a universal basic income. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr. Painter, and thank you for joining us today. Um, I really enjoyed listening to your speech. Um, next, I'd like to welcome the third opposition speaker, Professor Hilmar Schneider. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Professor. You have the floor. The President, ladies and gentlemen of the House, it's a great honor for me to uh, be allowed to speak here today. I've been listening careful to what my uh, previous what the previous speakers have been saying and uh, especially with regard to the proposition I couldn't disagree more to a lot of things that have been said and I'm afraid I have to repeat a lot of things uh, that have already been put forward uh, on behalf of the of the opposition to be honest the uh, unconditional basic income appears like a revenant to me that emerges from its tomb from time to time I myself first encountered the spectre in the late 1990s when a German prime minister proposed an unconditional basic income for all at the minimum income level as an answer to the supposed coming end of work. At that time, we developed a simulation model in my institute to estimate the required funding and possible behavioral responses of this proposal. The results were devastating. They got published and the proposal soon got forgotten. The narrative of the end of work still find its adherence today, even if the facts speak a completely different language. Germany has experienced three severe economic crises since the 1990s. Nevertheless, employment is close to record high today despite the pandemic and companies complain about an ever more threatening shortage of skilled workers. And guess what? The revenant is back again. The German Green Party seriously discussed it as a building block of their electoral program for the coming federal elections in fall this year. However, it seems like they eventually got convinced that this was not a good idea. Somehow it seems to have dawned on them that they should take the available simulation studies seriously. And being able to listen to the facts is definitely speaking in favor of the Greens. Now, when it comes to UBI, people typically think of money coming on top of what they already earn anyway. This is undoubtedly a pleasant idea and probably partly responsible for the fact that many people are rather positive about the unconditional basic income. However, Many people obviously seem to underestimate the consequences of the fact that the money must come from a real source inside their economy. And by the way, there is little to no lesson to learn from field experiments that were mentioned before, where a limited sample of people received a universal basic income over a limited period of time. All these experiments are suffering from the fact that the necessary amount of money comes from outside, provided, for example, by rich foundations or ministries of foreign aid and the like. As long as the necessary amount of money comes from an external source, a crucial element of a sustainable implementation is missing. Moreover, these experiments feed the illusion that it is about money that one receives in addition to one's income. As you will soon realize in practice, there will be more people losing money than people gaining money. As long as no aliens can be found who are willing to finance the system with their money, the universal basic income is nothing but a giant concept of internal redistribution. There is nothing speaking against redistribution in general, but redistribution needs to be sustainable. In the long run, you can only distribute money you have available. Spending money on credit won't work as a permanent solution. Simulation studies can help a lot in order to understand the monetary flows involved. However, I do not want to torture tonight with the results of simulation studies. For a rough understanding, it is sufficient in my view to look at the mechanics of an existing quasi basic income. Whenever a UBI is discussed, it is discussed in form of a pay-as-you-go scheme. This means income that is generated within a certain period of time has to be taxed, 
and redistribute it within the very same period according to a certain rule. So the question is, is a pay-as-you-go system required for a reasonable UVI sustainable? Speaking of a reasonable UVI means it is the level of the UVI that matters. So let me approach the answer by taking a look at an existing and reasonably well-functioning pay-as-you-go scheme. The system I have in mind is the German pension system. It is a UBI for people in retirement. In total, it affects one-fourth of the population as a whole. The average monthly payment compares to about 900 British pounds per month. This is in the magnitude to many UBI concepts under debate, and it's fair to regard it a reasonable amount of money. Now, where does the money come from? It is deducted from workers' salaries in form of social contributions and taxes. And the overall demand for pension claims accounts for an average tax rate of 20% on gross wages. There's nothing specific German to it. Wherever you would introduce a comparable system in any part of the world, the resulting relationship between tax rate and pension claims would be more or less the same. Now, extending pension claims to the population as a whole means to increase the number of pension claims by a factor of four. In order to finance this in a sustainable manner, it would require to raise the related social contributions and taxes by the same factor. This means a tax rate of 80% would be required in order to serve the financial demand of a pension for all system alone. Financing public schools, public health, public transportation, public infrastructure, public security, defense and the like would have to be financed on top. This 80% tax rate is a solid figure, nothing to be eliminated by rhetoric. And what would that mean in practice? Each worker would have to pay almost 100% of their salary to the state. In return, each worker would receive 900 pounds for him or herself. Non-working members of the household, typically kids, would equally receive 900 pounds each. You already guessed it. The money you hoped would come on top of your existing income actually at best compensates for the income loss due to the necessary taxation. Can you imagine what this might trigger in the minds of people when it doesn't matter for their income, whether they work or not, when it doesn't pay off any longer to invest in education, when it pays off to have more children instead? You might argue this is an exaggerated picture. It is not. To escape the unpleasant consequences of a nice idea, I often hear one would only have to tax the super rich. We heard it before. Taxing the super rich is the way to fix the issue. And this is, I'm afraid, an illusion too. Even if you would tax the richest 10% of income earners at a rate of 100%, you wouldn't get too far. You really have to tax very wide in the income distribution in order to get what you need. And please, don't expect the super rich in your country to dutifully watch their money being taken away from them. You may remember how Gérard Depardieu reacted when the French president François Hollande dared to introduce a 75% tax rate for millionaires in 2012. Depardieu became a Russian citizen and he was not the only one. As a result, tax revenues stayed way behind what had been expected. The tax cut eventually abolished in 2015. So do we have to bury the dream of more social justice? My answer is certainly not. A fairer society is needed and it is doable. The Central and Northern European countries in particular have proven this over the past 70 years. Yes, there is inequality here too in the distribution of material goods, in the distribution of opportunities. But we also reached a variable, very considerable degree of welfare and security for all. Capitalism does not work here in the same way as it does in the US, Brazil, or South Africa, to mention some. The fact 
that Britain possibly doesn't perform as well as other welfare states is not an argument to switch to a UBI. It's rather an argument to learn from each other. Europe has made a lot of progress in that respect, and Europe can become a role model. To continue to prove this tame form of a market economy in the future, to make it a global model even, under the conditions of digitalization, that seems to me to be worth all the effort. And for the sake of justice, it will be far more promising than a universal basic in income for all. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Professor, for a very, very fine speech and for joining us here today. So it now falls upon me to welcome the final speaker on the proposition side, uh, Mr. Will Greedy, who is a sponsorship officer and currently at St. Hilda's College, um, a first year. Will, you've got the floor, welcome. Thank you very much for that introduction, Mr. President. Um, and, and thank you also, Eliza, for that introduction earlier. Um, so in, in my speech, obviously, I'm coming after um, two great experts uh, on, on the proposition and a number of experts on the opposition, as well as um, two of my, of my peers. Uh, so there are, I, I, of course, have some questions of, of what I have to add. But I think the value I will have here is, is, is really in consolidating the underlying position of the case for UBI. And I think hopefully highlighting some, some, some key points I think are particularly relevant when we look to consider this uh, proposition. Now, first and foremost, I think a, a key element of, of the case for UBI and, and of the case for the, the necessity of this kind of program is the the wealth inequality and the returns to capital that we observe in the modern economy. All right, the modern economy, as has been mentioned by some of my colleagues on the proposition, is no longer one that uh, rewards labor adequately in a number of cases, and is no longer one in which labor is able to make meaningful demands on capital, capital and on the owner class um, when they are negotiating for wages, when they are negotiating for benefits, when they are negotiating for the conditions under which they will enter into employment. And on top of this, wealth inequality is, is, is not something that, that derives from a, 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 a you know, person to person uh, kind of effort committed to, um, to labor or, or effort committed to, to innovation. There are those who, through um, taking risks and through entrepreneurship, are able to make themselves incredibly wealthy, coming from very little. But by and far, the vast majority of wealth is inherited. And when we start to talk about, as, as one of my colleagues has previously, the interge intergenerational considerations that we take there, when the quality of life and the condition of life that you are going to have depends so heavily in the modern day on the wealth that you're born into and on whether or not you are part of the capital owning class. If we want to make a, gener if we want to make a genuine improvement in the quality of life of individuals, we need to help transfer some of those returns to capital, transfer some of that wealth, to the individuals who need it the most, right? When we look at funding UBI, we should look not to income taxes. Uh, Professor uh, Schneider has, has, has demonstrated very clearly why this is not a, a sustainable proposal. There simply is not enough income uh, for us to provide meaningful UBI. However, when we look to the amount of wealth, the amount of capital and, and, and the, the returns on that capital, especially in a, in a modern, fully developed country such as the United Kingdom, there is ample resources to fund a meaningful UBI that would allow us to better support the people who are most negatively impacted in the modern economy, wherein individuals lack bargaining power, wherein individuals lack the ability to negotiate, to say no to labor, or to say no to, to jobs that really do not benefit them and really are not a, a positive contribution to their lives, right? Now, kind of moving beyond this, 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 this point of wealth inequality and the fact that, that this is not something that individuals are truly in control of and, and the fact that, that we, this, this wealth inequality and the presence of this wealth and the presence of these returns to capital means that we can meaningfully fund UBI. Moreover, it is important to note that, that the success of corporations and the success of capital is reliant both on the political structure that we have created and that we continue to maintain 
And moreover, it is reliant in large part on the efforts, on the labor of individuals, on the efforts of individuals in our economy, and on the consumption by individuals on, in our economy. And, and I think this is important for two reasons. First and foremost, if capital and corporations are only able to be successful because of the political systems that we have created for them, that give them rights, that protect them, that ensure that they are able to generate vast, vast returns and, and that CEOs are able to earn millions of, you know, tens of millions of pounds a year. If we have created that system wherein they're able to do that, it is entirely reasonable for us to demand that as a consequence, we also provide a basic level of security to all individuals in our society. And that all individuals in our society, when, when we live in, in a world where, where we are able to produce so much due to our technology and due to our existing capital, that there should not be individuals who, um, as, as Ambika you know, highlighted so clearly in her, in her opening speech, there should not be individuals in our society that are so desperately failed by the system. And moreover, we should not be faced with the kinds of decisions that, that, that many individuals have to make on a day-to-day -day basis of whether to take jobs which are not, you know, do not meaningfully compensate them, which do not necessarily fulfill an individual in any way, shape, or form, which do not contribute positively to an individual's life, except for the fact that they give that individual a chance at escaping poverty. And when we look at, when we look at, you know, we look outside the United Kingdom to, to other developed nations, and, and you look at, say, for example, the U.S. as, as an American, I'm bound to return to the U.S., even working 40 hours on, on minimum wage in the United States is not enough to pay rent and to pay utilities and to pay for food and other necessities in, in the United States, in the vast majority of cities in the United States. And this is a pattern that, that individuals working at the very bottom of the earning class are, are not able to live sustainably in the current system. And when we have this kind of wealth, and when we as individuals, and when we as a society have created a situation wherein this kind of wealth is possible, it is entirely reasonable that then we then demand some portion of this wealth, and that we then give some portion of this wealth back to the individuals, that we allow every single member of our society a guaranteed level of security, that we allow them to, to actually make decisions about whether or not to work, that they are working for their own improvement, not merely their own survival, right? That, that when one enters, and, and I guess this is, this is to move on to kind of my, my final of my three prongs here is, is that as has already been mentioned a number of times, a universal basic income would fundamentally change our relationship to work and our relationship to entering into employment um, in, in our modern society. Right? Even a minimal improvement to security, even, even small UBIs, would significantly improve the, the ability of an individual to, to, to choose whether or not um, they should work and to choose whether or not a job is, is an acceptable way for them to make a living. Giving that kind of power back to labor would allow labor to demand better returns. And so not only would we see what we likely see um, kind of income per hours worked or income per hours worked on the lower end of the scale improved to some degree because people are able to say no to bare minimum wages and they're able to demand more from their employers. But people would no longer be forced to, in many cases, before, complete, before fully completing their education or before, before fully you know, being able to build up their human capital, people would no longer be forced to enter the workforce merely in order to survive. As has been mentioned previously, right, one of the things that, that we, we expect to see when we introduce a UBI is that people are able to better complete their education, whether that be in university, whether that be in vocational training programs, whether that just be in completing their kind of bare minimum education. And this means that we will have a, a, a society wherein people are able to live better lives, right? Even if even if they, they, we don't see economic improvements, the fact that people would be allowed to, or would be better positioned to make intentional decisions about how they want to live their lives, that we would have more freedom, that would, that would, we would see massive you know, tangible improvements in the quality of life for individuals that, that we, we, would, we get when we escape the stress of modern capitalist society. Human beings are not wired to live and to exist on this scale. We're not wired to work eight hours a day in a cubicle or, or behind a till. And if we create, a, if, we, if we look to create a society wherein people have security, wherein they're able to actually make decisions about whether to enter into employment rather than being forced into employment by, you know, 
is what is essentially in many cases the alternative of poverty or the alternative of 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 fighting with a broken welfare system for for some meager government support we would then see not only that 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 work improves but that people's relationship to work improves that people are able to to gain more on a more fulfilling level from their employment and we would see that we as, as the individuals and, and especially the people who are at the lowest level of income and who are often at the lowest level of education and who entirely lack wealth themselves would benefit from the system that has created such massive intergenerational wealth that has allowed corporations to succeed and generate incomes on the level that they have. And we have shown that it is entirely possible to do so if we rely not on purely income, but what if we rely on returns to capital and if we rely on the massive levels of wealth that exist in modern societies. So hopefully this has helped to, to, to kind of wind up um, some of the points that I, I personally believe are most important. And obviously I hope that the arguments of my, my colleagues on the proposition have been persuasive to you today. And, I, and if you believe in security, if you believe that, that we as individuals and that individuals in our society have a right to to, to, to choosing how they will work, if you believe that they have a right to a, a standard of living that is, is, a, you know, is above zero, that is above bare subsistence, and if you believe that people should not have to beg the government and fight the government for unemployment or for other you know, welfare and other benefits, I really think you have no option but to vote in favor of UBI. We have shown you that it is both tangible, that it is possible, and we have shown you the, the, the nu numerous reasons, be they pragmatic or be they principled, to support a universal basic income. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Will, for a very, very fine speech. Um, and indeed, thank you to all of the proposition speakers. To conclude the debate, I would like to pass on to the Right Honourable John Crudus, MP, um, speaking in opposition. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. President. It's been a good debate, um, very thoughtful, with uh, great contributions on both sides. And that's because UBI is a big, powerful idea. I can see arguments for and against. On balance, I remain cautious. Before the pandemic, amongst a growing vocal movement, it emerged as an economic and social antidote to automation. After the virus struck, many embraced the idea to remedy the fallout from contagion. All sorts of people, for completely different reasons, often very bitter political opponents think it's an idea whose time has come. That sort of makes me nervous. Um, now, in principle, UBI is generally understood to mean a regular state administered universal unconditional payment, but it's often used to describe all sorts of things, not technically UBI. It's sort of elastic, it's too elastic. And now a series of left-wing arguments have been made in favour. It clearly appeals to a left utilitarian argument to maximise the welfare of the maximum amount of people. Some argue it helps resist the commodification of labour. It nurtures unalienated non-market labour and helps the bargaining power of workers. Yet UBI is also rejected on the left. Many think it underplays the democratic qualities that should characterise a just society. It oversimplifies, standardises economic and social need through a universal monetary figure, triggers free rider concerns and underplays the significance that contributions should play in building a just society. In this sense, citizenship consists of deeper relations, duties and obligations to fellow citizens, questions of fraternity above and beyond money transfers. Liberal arguments in favour include the libertarian desire for individual freedom and re release from an overmighty state bureaucracy and collectivised public services. From a more progressive perspective, it can express a basic human right to a certain level of subsistence. There are also liberal arguments traced back to Thomas Paine that UBI, UBI respects the shared human inheritance of all citizens. UBI can also appeal to those operating within Republican traditions of justice. Guy Standing is a brilliant advocate of this position. It can secure freedom from domination or provide the freedom in time and resources to help citizens to flourish and participate and contribute to a just society. From an alternative feminist standpoint, it can challenge the idea of a male breadwinner and the character of domestic labour. Yet the idea also has political support on the radical right. Milton Friedman advocated a not dissimilar negative income tax to roll back the state. Charles Murray saw UBI as a vehicle to dismantle public services, labour and social security protections. Real freedom by replacing the architecture of the welfare state with a personalised fiscal transfer.
Yet to left-wing advocates, it offers precisely the opposite. It complements rather than substitutes for welfare systems and labour market protections. UBI separates wage labour from income and therefore confronts the very nature of capitalist reproduction. Yet for others, it simply acts to correct in-work poverty or the bargaining power of labour. Other advocates of UBI claim political neutrality and suggest it offsets the unequal consequences of automation. UBI will distribute what the robots, AI and machine learning will produce. The simple point I'm trying to make is that UBI is difficult to assess in terms of competing theories of justice or a simple divide between left and right. However, I put one warning note in, it's confident utopian advocates on the left should remain cautious when their most committed political opponents are also likely to support the idea, yet in order to secure totally different radical outcomes. There are also more mundane practical issues that we've touched on that confront advocates of UBI. Is it financially feasible? Is it more effective in securing what its advocates desire compared to federal job guarantees, universal credit or sovereign wealth funds? How is it operated in practice? Who benefits and who does not? What policies need to accompany UBI to ensure desired outcomes? Yet a lot of the practical evidence is pretty inconclusive. It basically concludes that affordability is linked to the level of UBI. It costs more to introduce a generous payment and this in turn shapes the concrete effect. The scale of ambition appears to define both its cost and consequence. Then there is a basic category issue regarding citizenship and the defined community within UDBI. Advocates must grapple with the politics of migration, free movement, and the modern insider-outside dilemmas that bedevil progressive politics and the search to redraw the social contract. Um, the writer Louise Haig has suggested that survive UBI needs to rescue itself from the hands of the polemicist, the populist and the reductionist, which has created a sort of solve all or solve nothing debate, a, a sort of absolutist debate where the strongest case for UBI, to me, the strongest case for UBI is part of an overall anti-poverty strategy rather than as an antidote to modern capitalism. So I sort of share that more pragmatic approach of Louise's. My real problem with the debate is how it is driven despite protestations to the contrary by deterministic assumptions of technological change, by those who celebrate the inevitable end of work. Technology is not destiny. If it were, we would all support UBI. If work were to end, the case for UBI would be much stronger than if full employment were feasible. If politics matters and could help create good, purposeful, rewarding work, then the case for UBI would be less overwhelming than in a world of inevitable bullshit jobs. I believe work to be a fundamental to humanity and a vital source of dignity. Today, the case for UBI is to offset future structural unemployment given technological change and automation. That is the loudest argument in favour of it. Yet there is no evidence that work will end. The robots are coming. The picture is more mixed, messy and indeed political. There is no compelling evidence of the robots imminent arrival. Indeed, we are confronting record numbers of job generated before the pandemic struck. Down the ages, the case for automation induced mass unemployment has regularly been made, yet has never turned out as predicted. It is a political contest. The danger is that UBI becomes almost a I give up policy on the politics of work. In the UK, UK before the virus struck, we we had the highest levels of employment for 40 years after the pandemic st work stopped and the furlough program was a UBI test drive. You can accept and support UBI as a short term remedy, correct a unique short term shrinkage in work, but also believe such a collapse should be used to once again challenge capital and rebuild the nature of work. The UBI debate reveals profound disagreements about what we value and the dignity of human labour. Even if technological change was wiping out millions of jobs, should we just accept this? If we believe in the dignity derived from good work, we should organize industrially and politically for decent jobs, income guarantees, collective rights, strong unions, decent public services, rather than a vision of mass welfare often associated with UBI.
there is a strong case against UBI if you believe the end of work thesis to be fundamentally flawed, if you believe the nature of work to be an inherently political question and reject a politics over reliant on questions of distribution and utility, and if you recognise the intrinsic value of work in the lives of people corroborated by all of the survey evidence available, UBI could contain destructive properties, rob people of meaning and dignity, leaving them more isolated, vulnerable, angry and humiliated and society less fraternal and solidaristic. It could offer the ultimate neoliberal endgame of isolated consumption with citizens transformed into ultimate passengers of capitalism. It could be a dystopian nightmare. Much fashionable interest in UBI should be rejected because of the indignities of life without purposeful work. On the basis of that argument alone, I suggest reluctantly we reject this proposition tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Crudders, and thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm going to welcome all of our speakers back on the screen, um, and we're going to go into gallery view and then get a snapshot photo of us all um, during these Zoom times. Cool. Now the results have come true. Um, on the closing poll, I'll do two things. I'll first announce the results of the first poll, so people's opinions coming into this debate. Then I'll tell you by percentage um, the final poll results and, and the winning side as a result of that. So in the first poll, there was a storming victory for the side in proposition with 68% of people who turned up believing that we should introduce UBI. This is before they'd heard any of the speeches and that meant 32% before any of the speeches in opposition in the initial poll. The final poll has shown a stark change in that. It's turned out to be a very narrow, um, perhaps relating to Brexit in some ways, a very narrow 46% in favour um, of UBI and 54% in favour of no. I'm aware the percentages were slightly different, but they were around there. Um, but that means that there was a substantial swing um, and that means that the opposition has it in this debate and that this House believes that we ought not to introduce UBI. A very, very warm thank you to all of the guests for joining us and all of the speakers, um, student speakers as well. This is the end of the debate. And with that, I remain Adam Robley, St Edmund Hall and your President.